that is being launched here at this event, uh, that's going to be available for access now, is based on an AI alignment assembly about uh, openness in the commons. Instead of me trying to explain it, I'm going to introduce my friend here, Shannon Tom, who is currently a fellow of the Open Future Foundation. There she researches democratic methods for governing artificial intelligence. Previously, she was a project manager at Scale AI, where she built data labeling products for AI applications and the marketplace for data labels. Uh, at Berkeley, she studied economic development and data science. Please join me in welcoming her and this wonderful. So what this says to us is that folks in the open movement have a set of general underlying ideas that tie them together. First, it's important for people to continue to have the ability to study and analyze existing works in order to create new ones. This is sort of the underlying idea of open and also what uh, our, our previous speaker Jeff was talking about. 90% said we should address the implications of gen AI for other rights and interests like data protection so the use of the person's likeness or identity. We'll talk a little bit more about this next, about what does it mean to expand the definition of open. 87% uh, agreed we must foster public investment into training data sets that are stewarded as the commons. And if we think about this largely in the context of public AI, this means there's really a role for public infrastructure and public resources. And lastly, 83% said we should define ways for creators and right holders to express their preferences regarding AI training and their copyrighted works. So next, uh, there is consensus between groups that openness alone is not enough. So this means we should care more about other values, including ethical principles. Uh, this is an interesting change, or not change, and like addition to the open movement, which we'll explore more in our panel. There is consensus, next slide, 
that we need public alternatives. And uh, as, as sort of part of the public AI network, I think this is a great move and step towards seeing public investment into public computational resources, into uh, non-commercial open public alternatives, things like this. Next slide. Um, we see Group B, the interventionists, they think that AI is exploitation of the creators and the commons. Um, in, this, in this little graphic here, we see overall staff and then the votes between Group A and Group B. Uh, this is really strong language that we're seeing people describe generative AI. Um, and so it's an interesting thing to navigate. What does that mean that this group thinks that AI right now is exploitation of creative commons? And what does that mean for regulation going forward? And last slide, uh, group A, regulatory skeptics, really say no to using copyright to blunt the effects of AI. Um, there are other legislative things that we explore within this, but copyright is one of the key areas that the open movement has had a lot of impact and considerations in the past. And we see Group A pretty much saying that we shouldn't be using copyright on to at least blunt the harmful effects of AI and automation on creators and workers. So I'm very excited to explore this report more in depth with uh, two very awesome folks. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, first, I'll introduce them, and then we'll have a little discussion on stage. I'm very excited to ask questions, and then also get audience participation in, in some of the questions as well. So if, you, if something comes up, let us know on those little cards. Um, so first, Avia is the head of policy and ethics at Luther AI, a nonprofit AI research lab. They translate Luther AI's expertise in machine learning into policy, informed by the latest LLM research, and promote best practices among open source and open-ish AI developers. In addition to open source advocacy, Avia works on data documentation and licensing for generative AI. So please give a hand for Avia. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Alec. Alec is the Director of Strategy at Open Future. He has over 15 years of experience with public interest advocacy, movement building, and research into the intersection of society, culture, and digital technologies. He is a sociologist by training and holds a PhD in sociology from the Polish Academy of Science. In 2005, he co-founded Creative Commons Poland and has since been an active member of the Creative Commons Network. He is currently a member of the Board of Directors of the Creative Commons Organization. So please welcome Alec. way back in 2005, and since then, he's seen the open movement evolve. He started the Open Future Foundation in consideration of a new openness. And this open movement is a loose group of people who essentially built, over the last 20 years, the open infrastructure on the internet. What is the relevance of the open movement today in the context of AI? I was trying to get a sense whether, when we say open movement, this is completely obvious to all of you. Uh, or something that needs to be explained, and Shani you did a pretty good job at the beginning explaining in broad strokes what it is, but basically just for those of you to whom this term is maybe unusual, if you use the Wikipedia, which I don't even think we need to do a raise of hands, then you are at least experiencing the outcomes of the open movement, and hopefully also sometimes press the edit button, start editing, and you become members of this movement as well. Um, this movement, I think, is relevant because it has been offering over the last 20 years one, I think, of the strongest ideas on how we might manage and develop and build technologies for our collective benefit. Um, there are other approaches, you know, that, for instance, focus on human rights, which are just as valid, but I think this, the, the, well, what I always found at least special about the common space or open movement is that it thinks so much about building. It's, it's a productive movement, it's a um, positive movement that wants to develop technology and balance the, the power of the technology, of course, of, with considerations that you mentioned on things like equity or digital rights. And I think today, specifically in the debate about AI, this movement is also very relevant. Why? Because 
suddenly it turns out that certain constituencies in this movement are really important in the discussions about technology. So open source development, developers are building these technologies, but suddenly communities developing you know, open educational resources, uh, curating collections of heritage, um, or working on open access suddenly find out that it's their works, the collections they manage are now all data and becoming data set. So that's why we thought it's very important to have a conversation. We admittedly made it sort of inside the movement because we are part of this movement, we are a think tank for this movement, but we think there's the data is valuable beyond um, this group. Great. Yeah, so generative AI as we know it now was built on open research. And Avia, in uh, 2021, Eleuther AI released the pile huge data set for training. Before that, we had ImageNet, we had Common Crawl, uh, and research was constantly being built and published, and the speed of this development has been just truly wild in the last 10 years. So maybe tell the people, what is an open model, and why is it important? Yeah, so first, let me distinguish between open weight models and open source models. Um, and open source AI, and how that sort of process of defining that is emerging. So there are a lot of models nowadays uh, where the weights are available. So weights, so the parameters are uh, like the numerical outcome of training a model. So that means that anyone can, for example, run it locally if they have the compute necessary. So this category of models, for example, um, has lama in it. Um, from Meta. Then there are organizations that kind of go um, a step beyond that, or, or two steps beyond that, and um, make it all available under an open source license, such that anyone can um, pre modify or use it however they want. Um, and I'm making this distinction because what we've learned sort of from the older open source movement is that eventually down the line, the uh, legal contracts do start mattering. <laughs> Once you start building a company, for example, um, on a model you found online. Um, and then, even further, there are um, groups, and this is what we try to do at Elite AI, that make the entire stack and everything that goes to the, into the model open. So they make the data set available, they make the code available, and they make the model weights available. And why, does, why is that really important for the user? Um, so there are so many benefits actually to this. So first of all, let me just say plainly that there are very important research questions that we simply cannot answer without um, open models, including open access to, uh, to the data that the models were trained on. Um, and like th these are not niche topics. These are, for example, um, this is research that has direct implications for policy, um, including current like current U.S. policy. Um, one such question would be um, influence between information in the training data and downstream capability with regards to dangerous capabilities. Something that is a live policy topic right now. Um, the benefits for innovation are massive because people can freely build and tinker with those models. Innovation, I feel like I'm, <laughs> feel like I'm forgetting some, but also uh, let's highlight that on top of open models, we also build a sort of open ecosystem of, let's say, open source evaluation libraries that then let people reproduce the research and have um, you know, for the results of testing. All of the benefits sort of only exist if we have open models. We can only have open source AI libraries if we have some models to run them with. Otherwise, no one would be contributing to those to, to those code bases. Can I just add, um, so we mentioned movement and model, and now 2024, the movement meets the model. Um, <laughs> I think it's a special moment. Um, and it's a moment where I mentioned already Wikipedia, I really like mentioning Wikipedia and the Wikimedia movement, but so this is where at the moment, if we were to compare it with like probably around 2005, maybe even earlier, right? Uh, these models exist, but we know this is just the beginning, right? You will be building new ones, the field will be developing. 
So the field of, let's call it open AI is not the best way to describe it as it's a proprietary name. Maybe open source AI, maybe common space AI. It, it's, it's all still emergent, like not the technology, but also our approaches to it. This is why we think it's important to talk with people, you know, and this is sort of these ideas around participatory governance of technology. I'm very happy they're gaining hold. There's a lot of ideas around um, citizen panels, around various forms of deliberation. This is one of these methods, right? The alignment assembly. It's important because we need in this moment all to ask ourselves. It's not enough, I think, just ask, let's say, developers, okay, how do you see the technology? But what we wanted to do is to, to sort of demonstrate that this needs to be a conversation. And it's not just conversation how we'll shape the technology, but what's for us important, it's a conversation also how we will understand openness. You know, it felt for a very long time, we've been doing this for 20 years by now, but it's sort of becoming business as usual. We have the Creative Commons licenses, we're applying them, we want them to be applied more and more. And I think now with AI there's a sense, not a shared sense as this data shows, but for some people that something is shifting, that, that the users are unexpected, that maybe we haven't learned everything yet about openness, that's why it's exciting. Yeah, on that, on that, right. Oh. So many benefits. <laughs> One additional benefit uh, is in transparency and information sharing. So, for example, um, every article in the US press that I'm aware of uh, that talks about LLM training data, large language model training data, and talks about specific examples is either ba based on our data set, the pile, or C4, um, the Coloso Clean uh, common call. These are Two open data sets that have been released by, by research groups. Again, I want to stick it very strongly. It's not just, oh, there are some benefits for transparency. Those articles could not have been written but for uh, the open research released by like, two groups of researchers. Yeah, and Amiya just shared all of these incredible values of open models. And as we've seen in the poll, as people are concerned about the impact of AI on the open movement, and you've sort of just alluded to this as well, um, on creators in the comments, on what we should do next as a movement. So ALEC is Group B. Uh, that's what we call the uh, regulatory, sorry, the interventionist. Um, so more, more cautious about AI, more pro-regulatory measures. Uh, why are some individuals and organizations in the open movement concerned about the exploitation of creators in the commons? So, I would say that because there hasn't been sufficient attention paid yet to setting certain guardrails, I think, or, and in some cases maybe even just explaining the technology. And I want to uh, underline that probably this applies the least to the models that Luther is building, because you made a very good point, how you really, I think, if, you know, the term AI ethics uh, is by now becoming a very widely used to describe almost anything, but I think with your work, we, we could really argue that you're, do, you're fully addressing these concerns. Um, but, but there are many other methods of developing which I think raise these concerns. I can tell sort of an almost personal story at the beginning of Open Future five years ago, one of the things we really wanted to do is to look at a very specific case from 2014. It was the case of one of the first major um, AI training models, a model for face recognition training. So it was a, a, a data set, sorry, not models. It was a data set for face recognition training. So what did it include? It included faces of people. And these faces were taken mainly from Flickr and from Wikimedia Commons, so they were interesting for us because they were openly licensed. Um, and one way of telling this story is that finally there was a significant use of openly licensed content. 100 million images were productively used to build a research resource that went on and there's it's documented again how many research papers were possible because of that. But there's also hints that this technology was then used to build all sorts of systems, some of them may be used for surveillance, and suddenly this story gets a lot more complicated and activists started have concerns, right? Especially if, as we've been discussing today, uh, I think throughout the day, openness sharing is not the only value. It needs to be squared with concerns of equity and um, human rights. 
So, so this is, I think, if, if I was to explain where this tone of concern appears, I think it, it, it often is because people feel we didn't pay sufficient attention yet to these issues. In your work in sort of exploring the paradox of openness too, right, like tying in how openness has increased access to knowledge and resources, but paradoxically it can also lead to their exploitation. Uh, how, how do you see that in conjunction with it's another good point, and I think this is where maybe the data we have highlights, I think, growing interest in looking at these issues together with issues concerning market power. I know in the US you now have a developing whole line of advocacy and policy work on antitrust, which is very interesting. There's recently a piece by a European economist, uh, Christina Kafara, who says, look at US. US is so ahead in thinking about these issues, Europe needs to catch up. I think that's a very interesting <laughs> statement because usually we say it's Europe who leads on regulatory uh, approaches. Uh, Kafar is a very recognized antitrust uh, economist, um, has made this point. And I think this is again what this data highlights. And th it, these are just insights, I would say, right? They suggest a certain direction. Um, but I would say that's a very interesting direction to pursue, to ask these questions. How do these open models, do they help us deal with um, concentrations of power? I'm personally hopeful maybe we'll return to it that they do. Yes, Avia, you're group A. So more optimistic about AI's possible benefits and more skeptical about specific regulatory measures. Um, do open models mitigate some concerns of Group B, and how should we think about the impact of AI on creators and the commons? So, um, short answer is very unsatisfying, it's like yes and no, depends on what your concerns are and what a specific project does. Um, open models tend to be uh, non-commercial or uh, research artifacts essentially. And a lot of people are specifically concerned uh, that the exploitation is coming at the price of value extraction of their data. In that sense, non-commercial research is, a, is much less objectionable for most people. Um, but if the creator's concern is um, use of their data at all, um, that will not be addressed by the model weights being, being open. Um, or even the researchers, or like the developers being transparent, that like this is what they did, you know, here's, we've documented our data sets, you at least can check that your data is in it. Currently for the models from most companies, you cannot even, even ascertain that. Um, but if you don't want your content to use at all, um, I think the answer there is um, an interoperable and open source opt-out system which we're strongly hoping from going to come out of come out of the UAI anti um exemption exception in the in the EU. Um, so it's a complicated picture. I, I certainly um, you know I'm like at a committed open source organization and we think about these issues a lot and I will never promote you know sort of promote openness as the answer. Um, it's a, it's a complicated picture but I think openness gives us tools to start working on these issues and like make real gains. For example, through interoperability, building systems that other can use. So if it works, you know, if the opt that works for one organization, it'll work for other organizations as well. Right. If I can just add, opt-outs I think are very interesting. I don't know, I think they've been mentioned today, by the way. I find them interesting because they're very specific. You know, I think a lot of the conversations we have are very high level, sometimes abstract. We talk a lot about consent. I've been involved in a lot of data governance conversations where we talk a lot about data rights. But then when the question is, okay, show that in practice, usually we don't have a good example. Opt-out is very specific form of consent, right? It's also very interesting because it's, it's, we immediately jump into this whole challenge with A, B, with balancing the need, the, which I think is completely correct, to protect some rights, but also to keep open innovation going. And I think Jeff Jarvis made a very good point that consent, when seen from a copyright lens, suddenly gets you very close to licensing. 
Consent can mean a mechanism, even infrastructures, which I hope we will build, and they will be amazing, that allow individual creators to have the right respected. If they really feel they don't want to contribute to AI training, it's, it's their fair right to do so. But if we switch from an individual creator to a um, publishing outfit, like a big newspaper, opt out at that level, usually we wouldn't call it opt out, we would say they are going for a licensing strategy, which Jeff very well describes all the challenges, there's a very high chance it will not level any playing field, it will mainly, again, strengthen market monopolies. Um, and, and, and that's why this is not research that gives us solutions to that, it rather tries to highlight some space of challenges. That's been one of the big challenges in the open movement, thinking about copyright in the past, right? That like being, What's your... being perhaps perhaps that being uh, more open on the copyright side has actually increased market power for specific large copyright holders, for example. And and the trick there is, I wish some economists really took on this challenge and gave us a very solid economics. Or um, I also like how. Um, Josh, you, you highlighted political economy. That's another angle. There is, if, if this is mentioned, but I think there needs to be research done on that, how it really plays out. But just to give one example, which I think is telling, again, coming back to Wikipedia. Wikipedia a few years ago introduced something called Wikipedia Enterprise, which is a technical tool. It's an enterprise-grade API, which allows big companies more secure, higher quality access to the data. It's obviously a response to the fact Again, very well known by all of us from our everyday practice that Google has info boxes that use Wikipedia content. And this leads Wikipedia to a position where it sort of needs to find a strategy for this intermediary, which both creates a new channel of reuse, which is valuable, but also creates challenges for an organization that in the end wants to have users directly use the content. So they created an API, but they also introduce voluntary payments. And that's, I think, the most sort of interesting here thing, and a sign that, I, I honestly think this was a very important sort of moment in the development of open approaches that sort of didn't receive sufficient attention. It's a big thing that basically Wikipedia came up with what in open source is called the freemium model. Uh, I'm a big supporter of this model um, because I think it, it, it gives sustainability and tries to deal with some of these challenges in an interesting way. No one is saying that we should regulate here the big players and how they, um, you know, access Wikipedia. No one is curbing their access, just the opposite, right? It's being facilitated, but with the idea that it's um, uh, reimbursed somehow. I, I find it very interesting. Mm, yeah, and on this question of sort of what are the different tools that the open movement has been used, has used in the past to think about their challenges, copyright has pretty much been the tool uh, that the open movement has been used has been using to sh to think about sharing. So a big part of the disagreement between the two groups is how we might use copyright, how we might consider fair use, how we should think about new licenses. So this is a huge meaty topic that a lot of copyright lawyers can sit here debating for ages, and no one on the stage is a lawyer. But, <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna tell you as much as we can. We're happy to discuss it anyway. That's right. We have opinions. So uh, first, like, are are current open source licenses applicable to models, and is this even the right question to be asking for either of you? I mean, in the U.S., it's actually disputed, but since I'm assuming there are copyright lawyers, I don't want to get into the question of output of computation being potentially copyrightable. I think. Currently, the license is just sort of like signal preferences, basically. They are vague signal preferences, which is how open source licenses function in the sphere of software as well. And I will think again, the non-lawyer in me will be very visible. For me, the starting point is that it's great that models are being licensed. And you're right, a lot of it is signaling. Uh, I know as a fact that some of the development teams even don't really consult with lawyers. They make sort of amateur licensing decisions, but I think they're very important. And I see this as a certain renewal and added boost to the whole uh, idea of licensing, of, of open licensing. The same thing that happened in the early uh, open source movement. 
people were also just writing their own manifesto of, 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 of manifesto of how they will derive their views. There's there are interesting developments again. Um, some kind of uh, consensus will need to be reached, but around two years ago, uh, so-called open responsible licenses were created by a team called RAIL, which stands for Responsible AI Licenses. Um, if you look at data on platforms like Hugging Face, they, these licenses get surprisingly large traction, around 30% of models um, are licensed that way. So, it's a kind of complicated story how you count these models because a lot of them are derivatives. But it's certainly something is going on. And again, it, it, it's a complex discussion because basically what these licenses do, they take a typical open source license and have these clauses that prohibit certain uses. And the biggest question is, are they enforceable? Because the open source, the sort of group A, if I can for a moment put that hat on, uh, immediately says, well, the, the price you're paying is you're limiting, potentially, access. And, 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 and the big question is, okay, if you're limiting access but protecting rights, then we can consider whether this balance works. But if your protection of rights is inefficient, uh, but you still limited access, then it's a net loss. And you, you, I guess that's the reason Luther uses sort of vanilla traditional open source. We don't. Responsible AI licensing because so because from our perspective, um, right, majority opinion among lawyers is that they're not enforceable. That it's like the behavior of those clauses are not enforceable. Um, and furthermore, we know from practice because we can just talk to the developers who are using the licenses. We kind of know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and what's going on behind the scenes is that there is no enforcement mechanism. And we are a very small entity, um, and it's hard to, like, we don't have the resources to, like, stick a lawyer on someone who we don't like using our models, essentially. So it would just be, we feel like it would actually be kind of pretending to be doing the thing. And it's very against the spirit of kind of how we, how we operate as an organization. I, I personally would not feel okay uh, with this sort of, like, veneer of responsibility. First, it's maybe worth um, complicating things just a bit more to mention that this is a global debate, right? We're regulating technologies that are applied globally. Um, I think that is, is a European one, and I think we have a slightly different perspective because now in Europe, the immediate thinking is, well, maybe the enforcement part will basically be done by the European Union and the new AI office, right? And it's that enforcement that will, in the end, create the same type of governance that you want from licenses, I know in the U.S. the conversation is very different it's, it's, with a very strong fair use commitment. In the U.S., what we're, what the mechanism would be is um, uh, private civil lawsuits are a completely different game, and that creates completely different incentives for actors. And it's actually a big problem for small actors because they can't afford the litigation, even if um, they win in the end. Mm, yeah, and I, I think this is sort of. Similar, we're talking a bit about boundaries, um, and, and I have a little note here uh, that is thinking a lot about uh, the tragedy of the commons. Um, here they say a commons requires boundaries, uh, and I think people will debate this, but the next sentence says an unrestricted open commons is invariably absurd, which is you know, an interesting and, and, and thing we should engage with a lot here. And he says, or they say that it's only in recent decades that we've come to understand the data and content of the web as a commons, and how can we form such a commons from the web? And I think here it's more like, how do we make sure that the public interest or can be maintained, or the commons can be maintained uh, well? And I think there are a few ways that we can talk about this. One is maybe AI in in Wikipedia resources or in certain comments-based data sets. Um, and if there are other ways that you want to talk about it, please pass forward another index card. Um, <laughs> so. I have an asymmetric communication here. We're speaking and you have to reply <laughs> to written tweets. <laughs> like <this a> lot. <laughs> um, but uh, there was actually really significant debate of this, so I, I didn't mean to make light of this at all. There was really significant debate on how 
whether or not AI should be used to create Wikipedia, whether or not we should be able to have human content alongside non-human content, whether or not that's actually the right question to be asked, like whether or not Wikipedia, I think in here it said 68% thought Wikipedia must remain human-crafted. So maybe let's address that first, like should AI be used in comments creation? I don't know if I can answer the, the comments creation as such, but on, on the question of Wikipedia, plainly on on pure technical grounds, I think the answer is no, because the current state of large language models doesn't give us the kind of like, informational assurance that we would like for an encyclopedia. It's just not a good use case for large language models to be creating an authoritative information text, as you've probably seen in the news, you know, lawyers um, trying to cite made up cases. You, you know, that, that's like a, a feature of large language models, how, that's how they generate language. So I just think Wikipedia would not benefit from here. So that makes me group, group, group B for that question. I guess. It sounds a bit, we, we're changing hats because despite your skepticism, I still think that a, a collaboration between the Luther and Wikipedia would be one of the coolest things. Hiding somewhere, there is an idea half baked that there's something you know that this mix of focus training and then focus application. Um, I don't know. Probably it doesn't need to be a new model, but maybe it's fine tuned. There's something exciting there to think because, I, by the way, I think we really need to look for specific use cases. This was all very vague. This was people throwing around the term AI that that need, at some point needs to stop. Um, so I'm, I'm here a bit more <laughs> optimistic, but going back to the, to the comments, um, just one thing I want to say, yesterday I was at the conference at the American University on, on copyright, very, very dry copyright issues with a lot of lawyers and just a single me sitting there, <laughs> feeling a bit scared. But um, someone mentioned this term sea of data, and it's a very beautiful metaphor that basically talks about global comments, right? And that's another interesting thing that AI did the comments conversation knowing there's now an organization called the Trillion Parameter Consortium. And I like to think that these trillion parameters that the data scientists talk about, we call that culture or the sum of human knowledge. And that's the trick, right? Like, what? how do we even conceptualize just, just everything that got written? And how do we define rules for governing it? Right, or for giving back to the comments. I think it's a very strong idea, give back to the comments. What does it mean if you're training on, on billions of things? Who do you give back to? How is it divided? I think we should be asking these questions. For us, you know, the emerging sort of our practice of Luther AI is that we do believe that um, training, um, including large language models on material should be considered for use. But at the same time, we don't monetize our models in any way and we just, you know, incorporate as a 501c3 in order to provide sort of like the research bedrock of LLMs to um, to academia and to and to developers and startups. So you can see kind of this trade-off. We feel like, you know, individually and where we lead, where we lead as an organization is that it's okay to take, but we don't want to wrap it in a ourselves. And uh, the open movement, this index card now, um, is asking, you know, it seems like the open movement has gone stale or might not have as much traction or resonance as, say, the movement 15 years ago uh, when Alex started his thing. Um, how can we bring freshness and new voices to the modern narrative? I think this is also really talking about our first point in, in consensus of that, that the open movement itself has some room to, to grow beyond its existing definition. So maybe you both can uh, share a bit about what you think as both fresh and uh, new voices. So one uh, response uh, regarding new voices, I would say is Luther AI. I mean, if you find out more about them, I wrote the report that we need new generations to be interested in openness, and then I met the Luther AI, and my wish uh, was fulfilled. I'm, I'm only half joking. I think there is this narrative, I will admit it, and if you're part of this broad movement, I wouldn't get too stuck, by the way, with the name. 
the, the generational change hasn't happened. There is indeed a lot of events where you go and you feel it's sort of the same people, and this is starts to feel like some kind of 2000s vibe, and maybe not 2020s. But I think if you, if you look closely enough, there are uh, you know, places where this new is emerging, and by the way, just simply at some point, people like me need to shut up with trying to explain what openness is, and because there are other people doing that who are coming with fresh perspectives. And also, I wonder to what extent this is because, at least in terms of open source, like open source one, like open source was 20 years ago, was vilified uh, and, and considered like a danger, but now it is the standard and it constitutes like a global public good that everyone, every developer ever, if you've ever did any computer science ever, if you use any device, if you connect to a server, there's open source throughout the entire stack. So I, I think maybe we've just gotten used to it. I totally agree with that. I, I sort of feel like everyone kind of assumes some level of openness about certain things, and it feels like maybe like the advocacy element of it is less needed. But now we've come to a new horizon where there are new issues and then a new need for fresh and new information and talent. Um, so we're, we're coming close to the end, and I have one last question for our two panelists, and it's why should government engage with open movement more broadly? Why is it really important that open movement stands here in, in the US? From my experience as um, someone doing policy at open source organization, oftentimes the, the open people can provide a completely different perspective, and they're completely unfiltered. <laughs> there, there, is no, there is no government relations person at this organization. Um, so it's both useful information gathering, um, but also it's a much smaller group of people in terms of people who do this professionally. You know, there are many, many, many open source developers. There are a handful of open source policy people, and we all know each other. And this means that there's sort of like a symmetry in terms of who gets represented in the conversations about technology to the government. Please talk to us. <laughs> Anything you want to add, Alan? I always think thinking about open source. That's the, in the AI context, that's the great promise. You have. Um, I know Josh talked about it in so many countries, often national, but not always, just a lot of development happening with a lot of really showing the promise of new technologies. And I think it's important to bring these voices to policy conversations. The other thing I think that's very important is um, we have by now really exciting building blocks around openness, you know, open data, open access. Um, these are other success stories, I would say. So it's like a good time to build on this instead of assuming that maybe I know it's done. Because that, that's worth mentioning, there is this challenge, you know. Um, I think we, we've grown overall as society, it's very impatient and we want something new to happen all the time. In fact, 20 years, th those are still new things, right? These are like new models of doing things. They're still very fresh and new and innovative, like Wikipedia, but I feel, oh, it's been around. No, it's, it's been around just for 20 years. So I think we need to um, still continue to demonstrate it, because there will be, by the way, that, that those signs of people reacting strongly, even to very loaded statements around exploitation, around, there is this risk that we can reverse on some of the ideas, right, around sharing as a result and go too far and stop sharing, which I think would be a bad thing the world. <laughs> <laughs> Go Sherry. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for listening to us speak. Thank you so much for Nick and Chris and, and uh, Health Knowledge and Emerging Technology for having us. And thank you, Alec and Avia, for being wonderful.